What if I told you there was a strategy with one of the highest win rates in the game, was nearly impossible to counter, and is such an easy playstyle that you could watch Netflix on your second monitor and still win the game? You'd probably think it's too good to be true, but no, Riot actually consciously made the choice to add it into the game all the way back in patch 12.13. And that patch single-handedly caused this one champion to become the most popular pick overnight, where she's stayed ever since. The strategy you are about to learn may just be one of the most accessible, beginner-friendly, consistent playstyles we've ever covered, while also being one of the most powerful. So, which champion will we be using to highlight this new strategy? Will it be Vayne tumbling our way in the side lanes to 1v9 carry? No, far too much mechanical skill. Or maybe it's Twitch roaming around the map picking up free kills. No, too much decision making and map awareness. Spoiler alert, it's none other than Sivir, the queen of wave clear. Now in this guide, we will be walking you through step by step every single phase of the game, teaching you exactly how to use this strategy. But I want to be clear, there are many other champions that can adopt the play style you're about to learn. That's why at the end of this guide, we have a tier list ranking other champions that can use the strategy. On top of that, there are core macro concepts throughout this guide that can be applied to any role or champion, so trust me, you don't want to miss this one, as there's something to learn for every player regardless of your role. Plus, I think your mind will just be blown away that Riot even allows this strategy to exist. So as we mentioned, we'll be going into comprehensive detail breaking things down from start to finish. So we should probably start, well, from the start. Here's what's amazing, I've never seen a strategy more consistent with how the early game plays out. At level 1, your plan is simple, we're going to set up what's called a cheater recall. The first step to doing this is to achieve a minion lead at level 1. Sivir is very consistent with this goal since she has great wave clear at level 1 with her Q ability. As soon as you enter the lane, you want to auto attack minions non-stop and throw your Q out to hit the minions. One useful tip is to try to aim these level 1 Qs so they hit both the minions and an enemy champion. Doing this will pretty much immediately guarantee you control the lane. Great, so we have the minion advantage. Now, we simply maintain this small minion lead. Notice how I'm no longer spamming my auto attacks. The enemy stopped damaging the wave, and so I did as well. This is important as you don't want to overpush the wave. Overpushing will cause the wave to crash far too early and without enough minions, which will then make it so you can't set up the cheater recall we'll be showing you shortly. When the second wave arrives, don't be afraid to trade with the enemy. You'll be spiking level 2 on them, and so it will either set them up to be all in, or you'll just get a huge health lead once you do the cheater recall. It's on the second wave, when the third melee minion dies, you'll spike level 2 on them, so be prepared to all in if they don't respect it. In this case, the enemy realizes we'll hit level 2 first, and backs off. This is actually perfectly fine. You see, now the wave just slow pushes, meaning we stop damaging the wave and only last it. We want to prevent the second wave to crash into the tower too early. Instead, by slow pushing, the third wave arrives in time to keep the wave outside of the tower. It's on this third wave that has a siege minion, we want to hard crash the wave and push it as fast as possible, and boy can Sivir push fast. Great, now the enemy will be stuck under tower farming the wave you just pushed to them, making them unable to match your recall. At the same time, the wave you pushed will have so many minions that it will take them a long time to actually clear it. And since it takes so long to clear, the fourth enemy wave will actually get stuck on it. When this happens, it causes what's called a rebound. See how the minion wave is closer to their side of the map than ours? Well, this means the minions are pushing to us. This is called the even minion rule. And it happens because the enemy's reinforcing wave arrives sooner, thus focus firing and damaging our minion sooner and causing it to push towards us. This is why the cheater recall works. The enemy can't recall, well we can, and then it pushes back towards us so we hardly lose any minions and have a nice wave built up for us when we get back. And here's what's really cool. Remember the enemy took damage both from poke and trades, and so we're not only coming back with an item advantage, but also a health and sustain advantage. Your goal here is just to thin out the wave, meaning try to damage the wave to the point where the enemy has around three caster minions more than you. This is the sweet spot that will let you hold a freeze indefinitely. In this case, the enemy Callista knows that being low on health, behind in items, and having no sustain, that she has no choice but to recall. However, by recalling, she's not just bleeding out minions due to our freeze. So by the time she gets back to the lane, we have 31 CS to 21, and this Callista played near perfect and it still didn't matter. Keep in mind, she didn't fall for the level 2 all-in, she didn't overstay and die when we got back to lane, and yet she's still behind. That's the power of the strategy. But it doesn't stop here. You know what's really disgusting about this strategy? Is there really is only one way to counter it, and that's to punish Sivir before the full power of her wave clear comes online. And so that naturally poses the question, when does her wave clear come online? Level 9? Level 7? No, it's as early as level 5. 
At level 5, you will have 3 points in your Q, which means you can clear the entire wave in just one spell rotation. Prior to hitting level 5, it will always take you 2 rotations of your spells, and that leaves you vulnerable to be traded with since the enemy will just see you use your Q and W on the wave, and then just go aggressive while it's on cooldown. That's why the Cheater Recall as an opener is so strong. We avoid our early weak levels by getting a push lead and setting up the recall timing to get an item advantage. And remember, the Cheater Recall will set up a rebound so the wave will push into us. For example, in this game I'm facing the strong lane duo of Lucian and Lulu who are just way stronger than Sivir early on. But by setting up the Cheater Recall into a rebound, the wave is now pushed to us. We just thin out the wave to maintain at least a 3 caster minion lead so we can keep it frozen at the safety of our tower. By doing this, you'll eventually hit your level 5 power spike, at which point you unlock insane pushing power where the enemy just doesn't even get to interact with you. And the early laning phase is really that simple. Cheater recall levels 1 to 3, and then freeze off the rebound until level 5. And now that you've unlocked your wave clear, there are two key strategies you're going to implement. The first strategy is recall timings. So here I just hit level 5 and check this out. I wait for the next wave to arrive, and with a simple W and Q, I clear the whole wave. I then use that wave of mine as a shield, walking forward hoping someone will trade with me as they will instantly lose due to a giant wave attacking them. And as easy as that, we just took half of Morgana's health bar. Keep in mind, you still need some common sense, I'm backing off here since that big wave is now being thinned out and isn't as strong. I wait for my reinforcing wave to arrive, and question time. Will I A look to use amazing spacing with my 50 auto attack range advantage on Morgana to land free harass? Or will I, you know, just forget it. Spoiler alert, I press W and Q and just clear the entire wave. Same pattern, walk the wave in looking for trades with my minions. You can even use these pushes to start farming plates and landing poke while the enemy tries to last it on your tower. Wait a second, look at Sivir's mana. This strategy is completely unsustainable. Skill capped lied to me, I'll just run out of mana and then die in lane. I'll never get diamond. I knew it was too good to be true. All right, settle down. This is where recall timings come into play. All you have to do is hit W and Q and recall after pushing the wave. And now I'm going to be honest with you guys, what you're about to see may make you think less of me. I'm not proud of it, but I had to do it just to prove a point to you guys. If we jump back a moment, there's one useful trick to make your recall timings insanely effective. Look to hard push the wave right before a siege minion wave spawns. And for those who don't know, a siege minion wave will spawn every third wave. The reason why this works is a siege minion has a lot of health and is slower to clear giving you more time to head back to lane after you recall. On top of that, it can absorb a ton of tower shots, which prevents the enemy from getting the wave to die to your tower and let you get back to lane in time. But that's really not what's disgusting though, so some of you may want to close your eyes. You see, when I get back to lane, I clear the siege minion wave, then the next wave is just a normal one, so I clear that one too. Now the next wave arrives, and some of you are probably starting to figure out where I'm going with this. After this wave, a siege minion wave will spawn again. So you know what I do? I shove it, and then I recall again. I know, I literally don't even have to lane against my opponent. Let's all take a moment and just appreciate how this Callista had to literally spend over 3 minutes of her life doing nothing but farming minions under tower. Naturally, when I get back to lane, she's just bored out of her mind and tries to brute force a trade to stop this living hell from continuing. But unfortunately for her, it's only going to get worse. Now don't worry, I'll be going over shortly exactly why we won this fight against Callista, as it involves a very important trick you'll need to know in order to execute this strategy. But first, I want to cover the second strategy you'll be implementing off your push, roaming. Let's hop into a different game to show you what I mean. So I'm in lane, and boy, can you guess what I'm about to do? That's right, press W and Q. I'm too good at this game. With the wave clearing faster than my self-respect, I now have a massive timing window to go do something before the next wave arrives. We could recall, as we just covered, but we don't need to as we have plenty of mana and aren't sitting on a lot of gold. Instead, I see my jungler is on the bot side of the map and call for dragon since we have it control warded. While all of that happens, the enemy tries to tower dive our mid laner, and so I just go to help clean up the kill. And what do you know? I even make it back to bot lane in time for lunch, which consists of a steady diet of minions. Essentially, you clear waves so fast, you just get this massive timing window that you can really do anything with. For example, in this game, I clear the wave and use the timing window to go help with Dragon. I then clear the next wave and go take Krugs with that timing window. Later on in the same game, I clear the wave to go get Vision, destroy Blast Cones, and take a Rift Scuttle. The point is, with how fast you clear the wave, and how the enemy ends up being pinned to their tower, you just have a ton of options to pick from, which is what makes this strategy so consistent. Now I already know some of you are thinking, well this all sounds great when you have control of the lane, but I just know something will go wrong in my games. Well check this out, in this game my support decided they needed some exercise and just started doing laps around in our jungle. Maybe they enjoyed the scenery, who knows. The result of this was that I was left to 1v2 in bot lane. Here's the thing, 
Your wave clear is so good that the enemy can't really get anything from pushing, as you can just instantly clear the wave. That's what's so insane about this strategy. You're very effective at both the offense and defense. Now, before we move outside of the landing phase, earlier we won that fight against Callista, and I said I'd tell you an important trick you need in order to execute this strategy. Well, here it is. Everything you just learned will work 99.9% .9 of the time as long as you follow this one rule. Always let your support be the one to make contact first. Let me show you what I mean. In this game, we're playing Sivir with a brand support against a Tristana Morgana. You already know what our plan is, we'll get that push advantage to set up the cheater recall. We have one problem though. Our brand support is just kind of sitting AFK. He's not trying to trade, he's not trying to land poke or damage the minions. Shocking, I know. If we pause here, this means I'll be the focus of the enemy trades. I'm the one who's positioned most forward. This is not the positioning you want. You see, as Sivir, you're trying to win mainly through wave control, not through trades. So if you try and trade with the enemy when the wave is in a neutral state like this, you'll just lose and get zoned from the wave after. Notice how every time I auto attack, I'm slightly moving back. I'm trying to move relative to Tristana and Morgana when they move forward, only to back up until my support is the one in front. I then get hit by one of the craziest hitboxes I've ever seen, but I use one of the tricks I taught you earlier. I use my Q to damage the enemy champion and minions at the same time, and you'll see me kite away instead of forward. I'm trying to get them to focus my brand, not me. Once they do then focus my brand support, I then try to move to help him and trade. Now, I know you're thinking, well, you're pretty low in health, this didn't seem to work at all. Well, this is why you'll want to start Longsword and Refillable Potion. We can just consume all of our refillable potion charges to sustain up and set up that cheater recall on the third wave anyways, which will fill it back up. Now I want to slow things down here as there's a very important lesson in movement here that you won't catch otherwise. So here, Tristana is making the mistake of initiating a trade onto my support. These are the trades we want where our brand will take damage and we won't. So notice how I click forward to get in a closer position to trade with Tristana. However, brand continues to walk back, so then I make sure to walk back with him as I don't want to suddenly be refocused. But then I see him turn around. This signals to me I can turn around as well and try to trade since Brand is the one being focused. But again, Brand walks away, so then I have to turn around and also walk away. When we play this at normal speed, it will literally look like nothing was happening, but there was this whole mechanic going on underneath the surface. All right, so I begin damaging the wave and again, pay attention to my positioning. When I see Morgana or Tristana move forward aggressively, I begin moving backwards. I never want to be the one to make first contact in these trades. Keep in mind, I literally spike level 2 over the opponent and my brand is just standing a mile back. I don't make the mistake of trying to trade off this level 2 advantage as I'd still be the first one to make contact. Sivir just isn't good at winning straight up trades, so your priority should always be to get that wave control advantage. If the waves are relatively neutral, then you'll always need to remember to back up until your support makes first contact. Now, the third wave arrives and it probably looks like we can't cheat a recall. I mean, we didn't build up that big minion lead in the first two waves. While Sivir is kind of just that broken. Sure, we can't clear the whole wave in one spell rotation like we can at level 5, but with two spell rotations, we're still able to set up a recall timing. Also, our brand support didn't even match our recall. Like, this is truly one of the worst supports you can have. He sat back and done nothing so far, and doesn't even take a free recall timing with us. Instead, he ends up just having to trade his flash while just kind of sitting there, not even getting minion XP. Yet, it doesn't really matter with the strategy. I get back to lane with full health, renewed sustain, and an item lead and immediately begin trying to thin out the wave so I can maintain that freeze in front of the tower off the rebound as we covered earlier. But our brand, with no flash, decides now's the time for him to start harassing and getting aggressive. Check this out though, since Tristana is the one who jumps in and makes first contact, by the end of the fight, sure, our brand is dead, but Tristana is extremely low in health. I'm actually in a fantastic position. Tristana has no way to push me out of lane due to my health lead, and I'm poised to freeze the wave in front of my tower, meaning if she recalls, she'll lose a ton of minions. And likely realizing how bad of a spot she's in, and how she needs the wave to crash, she tries to all in me, but with the health and item lead I have, it's easily won. This right here is the power of letting your support make first contact on trades. In fact, I then reset and get back to lane with the same game plan. We're not level 5 yet, so we want to thin out the wave, try to maintain a freeze, until we hit that level 5 breakpoint. I'm really just playing defensive and backing up if the enemy tries to move in to trade on me. Again, Tristana jumps in and focuses the support, which she kills, but then since I'm completely healthy, I'm able to clean up the double kill right after. So now if we go back to that original Callista clip, you'll see that tactic in action. Callista moves forward, and I make sure to move back since I don't want to take the initial contact on the trade. Then notice how Lulu starts moving forward. I basically just mimic her positioning so I'm ever so slightly behind her. Then, as soon as Callista focuses Lulu, I know it's GG, and commit to the fight. This is why in these clips, it looks like the enemies are just inting into me. 
put yourselves in their shoes. You have a Sivir who's just going to push you in, and every time you move forward, they just move back, so you can never trade with them. They're then setting a permanent freeze on you. Finally, you get the opportunity to trade with their support being in range, so naturally, you take it. But that just results in trading your life for the supports, leaving Sivir alive to clean up. All right, so before we jump into the macro portion of this guide, which trust me is absolutely insane, let's just briefly recap what our game plan is when laning. Levels one to three, you look to implement a cheater recall. When you get back to lane, you then look to freeze until level five. Once you're level five, you'll be able to clear entire waves in one spell rotation of your Q and W. You want to either take recall timings off these pushes or use them to take things in the nearby vicinity, such as vision control, dragons, reacting to fights near mid lane, or just taking a jungle camp. Remember when doing this, you need to just follow one rule. Always let your support take contact first on trades. And if in the event your support is truly hopeless and it's genuinely a 1v2, well, you're incredibly good at just holding the tower by yourself and stalling the enemy's ability to take the tower or snowball anyways. And that's it. It's really that simple. No learning complex mechanics or matchups or combos. That's pretty much everything you'll ever need to know when it comes to laning with Sivir. You know what's really crazy though? That's not even Sivir's real strength. She truly begins to shine once the laning phase ends. And before we jump into the macro section, I just want to let you guys know we actually created an entire course just for this guide at skillcap.com. We sent out real players just like you to try out this strategy all the way from silver to diamond ranks. We then reviewed the replays to identify the most common mistakes players made when trying to execute the strategy. For example, why players were failing to execute the cheater recall that we just taught you, or what to do when you can't get the push advantage at level one. We even break down the most common macro mistakes that you'll make in both low and high elo. This entire course totals nearly two hours of additional content that you can only unlock by clicking the discount link in the description below. All right, now let's talk about what to do once the laning phase ends. Laning phase typically starts to end around the 14 minute mark. This is when tower plates expire and towers become much weaker in terms of resistances as a result. When these towers are then inevitably destroyed, it gives a longer timing window for someone to push and then rotate elsewhere. Thus, people are no longer stuck in lane as much, and there's a lot more rotation and action on the map. So when the laning phase ends, you'll be at your strongest by swapping with your mid laner. Here's a really good example demonstrating why. So right now my support is dead. I know, shocking. And so the enemy is barreling down mid lane looking to take the tower off that number advantage. You can see how none of my teammates are responding to this, and are just kind of leaving me on my own to defend. For most champions that would be extremely tilting, you'd have to just watch the tower fall. But in Sivir's case, just her W alone can clear entire waves. The enemy will just have no time to actually damage the tower. You can see how the enemy team then realizes just how pointless it is to try and push into a Sivir. So they leave to try and collapse on top lane. But this power of wave clear, it goes both ways. All you need is one second to be left unattended, and you can just instantly push a wave towards the enemy's mid tower. They basically have no time to try and do something on the map. They need to get back to defend the tower and pick up that wave. But what you want to do is use the timing window where they're pinned down to that tower picking up the wave to pivot off and get an advantage elsewhere. In this case, I steal the enemy's jungle, a rift scuttle, and get back in time to pick up the wave and defend my tower. It's not just about the fact that you can hold pushes in mid lane, it's that you can then go on the attack and push waves to create timing windows for yourself. The reason why this works so well is you're doing it in mid lane, the center of the map, so that pivot off your push gives you access to, well, kind of everything. You can use this timing window to either get huge farm leads or take in enemy jungle camps or by just reacting to team fights you know you'll win due to them being a number advantage. And with this core macro concept of control waves in mid lane in mind, you'll effectively have four different options. The first one is simple, you just saw it, you'll be responsible for holding a push from the enemy team on mid until they stop sieging. The second is pushing the mid wave for objective control. Here's an example of a very, very common tactic. You push the wave mid, this wave then gets vision on the enemy and pins them to their tower as they pick up the wave. This then frees you up to rotate to dragon while they're pinned down to take it for free since you'll have the number advantage. Now, here's an example of the exact reverse. The enemy is the one who is able to push the wave and pin us down and then gets control of dragon. In these spots, simply push out mid. You push so fast as well as destroy towers so fast, you're able to take towers and even at times the inhibitor if the enemy doesn't react and send someone to defend. And I know, some of you are thinking in your games, the enemy would never let you do this and would send someone to hold your push. Well, guess what? That's also great for you, as then they're then pinned to the tower from your push so you can rotate back to Dragon to take a 5v4 fight in your favor. Here's a different game, but same macro concept. I want to push out mid first, pin someone down, then rotate off to get a number advantage fight with my team. However, Notice how the enemy team overcommits trying to fight my team instead of defending my push, so it's another free inhibitor. And this one is my favorite example. Here it's only 20 minutes into the game. I head mid to implement this core strategy of pushing the wave. I see a fight break out in the top river. Now the entire enemy team is alive and looking at the minimap I want you to tell me, 
Should we either react to the fight or should we look to push out mid? Keep in mind, our Yasuo is bot lane, and so it's too risky to teamfight here as it could easily be a 4v5. Instead, we have that guaranteed advantage from just shoving down mid. And sure enough, we were outnumbered and we completely lost that fight. Now, here's what's amazing about this strategy though. The enemy team always freaks out in these positions. They know they're going to lose both inhibitors, which isn't worth the three kills they just got in that team fight. At the same time, all five of them can't do Baron since Yasuo and I will just end the game. So what do they do? Well, they do what players always do in solo queue, absolutely lose their mind. Vigar teleports, Pike recalls, some cancel their recalls, their AD carry goes top to farm, and Fiddlesticks and Aatrox start Baron. What result is them just throwing the entire game, dying, giving us Baron, and then surrendering immediately after, which is hilarious, but also perfectly illustrates how effective the strategy is. Keep in mind, if we go back to the start of the sequence, a lot of players would look at this and think, it's just a random team fight that's breaking out. Let's go help out. In reality though, if we react to it, we die and the enemy can easily take Baron and defend at the same time. If you didn't know the macro concept you just learned, you would basically throw the game into the enemy's hands. But since we knew to use the tactic of pushing out mid, we literally won the game off it. Great, so we talked about how by rotating to mid, you can one, hold the tower, or two, push the wave to either set up rotations to objectives or just take them. The third option has to do with farming. For example, here I get to mid and begin pushing out the wave. If you look at the minimap, you'll notice there's really no objectives for me to take. My entire team is off the map except for Zerath, who's in bot lane. In these spots where there's nothing for you to do, you need to look out for jungle camps to take in between waves. In this case, it's the nearby wolf camp. Again, you can see the power of our wave clear, we can just clear jungle camps so fast. This lets us get back to mid in time for the next wave. Once we clear that, we have another timing window to go do something. Now, if we look at the minimap in terms of jungle camps, we have our Krug's top side and Gromp and Rift Scuttle bot side. If there was nothing else for us to do on the map right now, we'd want to head bot side to take the Scuttle and Gromp and then head back mid. This is because our jungler and many of our teammates are top side. They would likely take the Krugs. We're not trying to steal camps away from our teammates. We're just picking up camps that are left unattended. In this game though, a fight breaks out in the top river. To give you context, in this game, our team is ahead around 5,000 gold. At the same time, we spot Trist on a bot and Jack's top, meaning if I rotate to this fight, it will be at worst a 3v3 until our brand catches up. Given that we're ahead, I'm fine taking with an even numbered fight. Hopefully you can start to see how by pushing mid, you're really just creating timing windows. We can react to fights or we can look for jungle camps to farm. After this fight, I head back mid and push out the waves to pin down the enemy again. This then gives me another timing window to take jungle camps, in this case, stealing the enemy's wolves and raptors. This is a very, very important concept for you to understand. This concept of farming jungle camps as this is how you passively get ahead throughout the game. If we take a look at mid lane, you'll notice how close raptors and wolves are to this lane. This means if you're holding pushes defensively, you always want to look to take your own wolves or raptors between the waves. And if you're the one on the offense pushing the enemy, then you want to look to pivot into the enemy's nearby jungle. I promise you, whenever I play Sivir, I literally always get 10 CS per minute, and this is the reason why. Okay, so all of this sounds fantastic, but I already know a lot of you guys are wondering, what do you do when your mid laner refuses to swap with you? Well, don't worry, you can still implement everything you've learned, just with a slight variation. So, you can see in this game, I'm leaving base and my mid laner is, well, mid lane, surprise. At the same time, the enemy AD carry is pushing bot. This means there will be a big wave of minions arriving to my bot tower very soon. Since my mid laner in this game, Morgana, is staying mid and not rotating bot to take that farm, it would make no sense for me to go mid. All we would do is share gold and experience and would be losing all those minions to the bot tower. So I just simply head bot to pick up the wave. This is fine, you don't have to be mid 24 seven if your teammates aren't swapping with you. Now, when I get bot, I push out the wave and here if there were any enemies missing and my team wasn't base or dead, then I just back off, probably rotate to my Gromp that's respawning to take that as I transition back to mid lane. However, you want to be on the lookout for spots like this. Notice how we see Alawi topside and three of my teammates are pressuring around mid and we see the enemy Zerath and Pike in mid lane. This is how I know I'm safe to keep pushing this wave. And this is so important, so listen up. Just like how in mid lane examples, we push that wave to pin down the enemy and then pivot elsewhere, you can do the exact same thing in a side lane. By pushing that extra wave, we've now lured Caitlyn away from the fight and pinned her to the bot tower. We then pivot off the bot tower and rotate to mid lane to create a number advantage fight in our favor. And it's not just about this one strategy of pushing into grouping. You can still just straight up split push in the right situations. For example, here I start out pushing mid while I wait for Morgana to respawn. Once she does respawn, I now know we have enough numbers with the enemy allowing top for it to at least be an even fight. So I push mid again to set up for that pivot to dragon. With our vision control and the push wave mid, my team doesn't really need my help, so I decide to pick up the wave bot. Now, again, it's becoming clear to me that this Morgana has no intention of ever going bot side. 
and obviously going mid to just split farm with her is less than ideal. If we take a look at the minimap, we can see the enemy Zerath mid, we see Alawi top, and we see Kaelin and Pike near Dragon. In this case, only Diana is missing, but with a ward on Krugs, I know I'm safe from her jumping me from a brush. Again, there's really just one key macro concept here, is that if you push one extra wave, it's going to apply a lot more pressure. If they don't send someone to defend your push, well, you're threatening to take the bot tower. And if someone does come to defend, well, you simply rotate off. In this example, I still see Zerath and Pike mid, and Alawi top. Now you're probably thinking, continuing to push is incredibly risky. But here's the thing about Sivir. She has a great ability to escape with her ult, her movement speed on her passive, and her spell shield. I realize that there's potential for both Diana and Kaylin to come botside to try and kill me, but my plan will be able to just pull that pressure and then run away safely. This would then result in a number advantage from my teammates everywhere else on the map. At the same time, if they don't send Diana, well, I'm too far ahead of Caitlyn, so she can't hold the tower on her own. You can see how by paying attention to where people are on the map, you can just uncover these macro plays that result in a win-win, no matter what the enemy does. In this case, we spot Diana topside in our jungle, so we're safe to both try and take the tower and kill Caitlyn. And of course, the same fundamental concepts I'm teaching you apply. In between waves, look for jungle camps to take in order to continue to get ahead. Here's another extremely common scenario that you're going to find yourself in. I see a big wave bot side, but my team is grouping taking Rift Herald. In this game, we're ahead by around 8,000 gold, so I'm fine with taking even numbered fights, so at first I move to group in case the enemy tries to fight. However, once I realize there's three enemies mid that can't possibly get to Rift Herald in time, I just head straight bot. Now, you've probably been in this position, you go to pick up the wave bot side, but then your team makes the super common solo queue mistake of trying to force fights while one player is off the map, picking up a wave in a side lane. Don't worry, as you can use your team's map pressure to actually freely split push and get yourself extremely fed. When I begin clearing this wave and see the enemy catch my teammates, I'm actually so happy. With how fast Sivir pushes and takes towers, I'm able to not only farm a ton of waves, but also just take the inhib tower before they can even recall to defend. Again, same concept of pivoting off a push once the enemy is pinned down, where I then take jungle camps. And again, the exact same concept I've taught you. Dragon is up, we want to take it, so I push mid first to pin down the enemy and then set up for the rotate. At the start of the sequence, I had 9,900 gold, and at the end of it, I had 10,900 gold while also getting an inhibitor tower and a dragon. Keep in mind, I'm getting this while my team is actually dying and losing fights. This is the power of these macro concepts. Now, you're probably excited about all this, but you're also wondering in the back of your mind, okay, how do we actually end the game though? Well, here's the thing. Everything we've taught you is fantastic at creating advantages and getting you extremely farmed and fed. At some point though, you'll be strong enough that your team can actually threaten Baron. When that happens will depend on each individual game, but at some point, usually when you have at least three completed items, not including your boots, your DPS is so high that taking Baron is a viable option. When this happens, it's very simple. All you have to do is implement the same push into pivot strategy that you use to secure dragons, but just pivot to Baron instead. Here, you see how I push down mid and take the tower since it's very low on health. I then push the next wave and know I have a great pivot to Baron as my incoming wave will act both as vision, but also pin the enemy down, making them slow to react to defend against it. It also just makes it very safe to secure vision. Since we pinned enemies first, we now know we'll have a number advantage if anyone is in their topside jungle. This actually results in us getting the pick on a Lowey, and now with a number advantage, I call to start Baron. You can see how once you're strong enough, you really only need one other person. Keep in mind, even if the enemy team was able to collapse on us, that's great. We pop our ultimate to turn on them and win the 5v4 fight. This is why threatening Baron works. You're using your wave clear on mid to pin down the enemy and secure both vision and control of the area. Now the enemy has to face check into Fog of War to try and defend the Baron. If while doing so they make any kind of mistake, we just pop our ult to start the engage and win the fight. Alright, so before we jump into the tier list of champions that work well with this strategy, let's firstly quickly go over Sivir's build. I recommend starting Longsword and a refillable. This works extremely well with the Cheetah Recall strategy. Off your first recall, don't be afraid to buy a Cull if you have enough money for it. You farm so much that you'll easily get to 100 stacks extremely fast. From there, you want to rush Kraken Slayer and Berserker's Graves. After that, get a Phantom Dancer and Infinity Edge. Sivir's playstyle is all about just sitting back and DPSing while your W bounces and crits everybody, and this is what this build excels at. You want to get a Lord Dominic's Regard as one of your final items, as this will give you max crit chance with armor penetration. The last item is completely situational, and you grab what works best to counter the enemy, but most often you'll be picking between a Guardian Angel or a Mercurial Scimitar. Additionally, once you're full build, don't be afraid to actually sell your boots for a more expensive item of your choice. You'll have enough movement speed just from your ultimate and passive that boots won't be that important in the late game. Now for runes, we want to go into the Precision Tree to take Lethal Tempo, Presence of Mind, and Legend Bloodline. 
Legend Bloodline is very important to take, since it's unlikely you'll get any other form of lifesteal in your build until the absolute late game. You can then take Coupe de Grasse against squishier comps, or cut down against tankier compositions. Your secondary tree is Inspiration, and you grab Magical Footwear and Biscuit Delivery. Magical Footwear is great since Sivir gets a lot of innate movement speed. She doesn't need to rush boots like other champions might. She also benefits more from raw attack damage early on to boost her wave clear and lane, rather than just raw attack speed you'd get from the boots. The combination of Biscuit Delivery and Presence of Mind is also extremely important, as you need as much help as you can get to help regenerate mana since you'll just be spamming your spells often to wave clear. You then grab Attack Speed, Adaptive Force, and either Armor against AD comps or MR against AP comps. For your skill order, you take Q level 1 and W level 2. This is what gives you the wave clear needed to set up the Cheetah Recall. At level 3, you take 1 point in your E to help you win trades in the lane, and from there you max your ultimate whenever possible, then max your Q, then W, then E. And finally, for your summoner spells, Flash and Exhaust is taken if the enemy has a lot of melee assassins or bruisers. Since you don't have the greatest self-peel, you need Exhaust to help out. Otherwise, we recommend you take Flash Heal if facing a lot of ranged champions, since they simply won't be within Exhaust range enough of the time to make use of it. Okay, and lastly, let's talk about the tier list. So, for the strategy, you really want champions with strong wave clear from distance who also scale relatively well. Additionally, this strategy is great when you have an Assassin or Bruiser mid lane, since it's ideal to swap lanes with those types of champions once the laning phase ends. In the OP tier, we have Sivir. No one can compare to her in terms of strength with the strategy. In the S tier, we have Vigar. He's the second best at this playstyle as he has infinite scaling and just great wave clear from a safe distance. In the A tier, we have Jinx, Ziggs, Varus, and Karthus. These four have great wave clear and scaling, but just aren't quite as safe compared to the picks above and so less consistent. Now, those are the main picks we recommend if you want to just go out and mimic this strategy exactly as taught. But keep in mind, concepts like pushing mid into pivoting, pushing to create recall timings, many of the strategies learned can be done on literally any champion in any role. So keep your eyes open for opportunities to execute what you've learned, even if you don't play any of the specific champions listed. Additionally, as a heads up, if your teammate does lock in a heavy wave clearing mage like a Nivea, well, do be aware you'll have some anti-synergy going on as you both fill a similar role. You may want to consider picking a strong split pushing champion like Vayne, Lucian, and Kai'Sa in those spots instead, but it's completely up to you. And if you guys enjoyed this video, then you'll absolutely love our brand new course we made just for this guide at skillcap.com. We sent out real players just like you to try out this strategy all the way from silver to diamond ranks. We then reviewed their replays to identify the most common mistakes players made when trying to execute this strategy. For example, why players failed to execute the cheater recall that we taught you earlier, or what you should do when you can't get the push advantage at level 1. We even break down the most common macro mistakes that you'll make in both low and high elo. This course alone totals nearly two hours of additional content that you can only unlock by clicking the discount link in the description below. Alright, that will do it for this one. We hope you guys enjoyed it, good luck on Summoner's Rift, and we'll catch you in the next one.